Hello and welcome to Program It Yourself in Java. My name is Chris, and in this episode, we are going to take an in-depth look into the variables of Java. Before we do that though, there is something I forgot to mention in the last episode that I am going to address now. I am talking about the way the compiler reads and processes our code. Now, just to remind you real quick, the compiler turns our code into machine code, which then can be executed. The compiler reads our code in sequence. So imagine we start our program and come to the main method. Our first statement is to print hello world to the screen. Then comes the next statement, and the next one, and the next one, and finally the last one. Now this may have been pretty obvious to you, but I'm just mentioning it for the sake of completeness. Now this is actually really interesting and important. Have a look at this line right here. In order to add the values of number 1 and number 2 together, we first need to know what number 1 and number 2 mean and which data they hold. Imagine we take this line and try to squeeze it inside of here. We would get an error saying that number 2 cannot be resolved to a variable, even though we created it right here. That is because at this point in time, the variable doesn't exist yet and the compiler doesn't know what to do. And it's probably going to crash and we don't want that. So let's just put it back to where it was. Now, in the last episode we wrote a simple program that performed some basic addition. Fortunately, we're not only restricted to adding two numbers together, we can also subtract them using the minus symbol, multiply them using the star symbol, or divide them using the forward slash symbol. Now, because I'm curious, I want to know what 5 divided by 7 actually is. So let's have a look. Let's see, it should be somewhere between 0. Look, I'm no mathematician, but even I know that can be true. So what's wrong? What's going on here? Maybe Java isn't such a great programming language after all. Well, actually, the problem sits in front of the computer, as is the case 99% of the time. The program did exactly as we told it. We created variables of the type integer, divided them by one another, and stored the result inside of another integer. And this is what we get, an integer. Now if only there was a way to store floating point numbers. Hey, how about float? Yeah, that works. Okay, before we move on here, this may be a good time to bore you with some theory behind variables. In addition to what I said last time, when we talk about variables in computer programming, we mean a container that gets allocated within the RAM of your computer. Each container has a name and holds a value which we can access in the program. We know that much already, but there are two distinct types of variables that we can distinguish. First, there are the primitive data types. Integer and float, for instance, belong to this group. Then there are complex data types. We are not going to deal with those for quite a while, except for a very common one known as string. Now, a key element that separates primitive from complex data types is the fact that their container size is dependent on the kind of data they hold. Let me give you an example. Imagine you create an integer variable and call it myInteger. This gives us a container that takes up 4 bytes of memory from our RAM. No matter which value we store inside of myInteger, whether it's a small value, a large value, or even a negative value, it's always going to cost us 4 bytes of memory to store that information. Now, there are different kinds of data, and they vary in their sizes. We will explore them as we go along and discover their usefulness, but for now let's just have a quick look at what we have at our disposal. So let's get rid of this first. There we go. The two types we already know are integer and float. So let's type this real quick. Now I did this by reflex already, but you can see that I added a little f here after the 5. I will tell you why I did that in just a moment. So, with these data types, we know that we can store numerical data. But we have more types to store this kind of data as well. Now you might be wondering, well, why do we need more types? Shouldn't this be enough? From a beginner's view, this is a valid question. But remember when I was talking about the sizes of containers? Integers and floats consume 4 bytes of memory each. As such, the maximum values they can hold is limited by that. What if we want to hold bigger numbers? For larger integer values, we can use the long data type. While a long takes up 8 bytes of memory, it can store far wider ranges of numbers. Now the values I'm assigning here are far below the maximum range of the respective containers. So don't worry about running out of size or anything. 
Like I could crank this up to 500 or something, it doesn't really matter. But if you want to go below 4 bytes, you can use the short data type. And if you want to go even lower than that, you can use the byte data type. Now let's adjust this so it looks neat. There we go. A byte, as you can probably tell, consumes one byte of memory, and a short consumes two bytes of memory. Now I'm just listing these here for completeness sake, but in most cases, especially as a beginner, you're well off just using integers. Now we also have a larger data type for decimal values, and that one's called double. My double, whoops, there we go. When we use doubles, we can get better precision for our decimal values. This pretty much means we get more digits after the comma. Now you still might be wondering why I added the f at our float variable here. Well, let's take a look at what happens if I take it away. We are getting an error saying that the value we try to assign to the variable is seen as a double by Java. This means that we're trying to store a double value inside of a float container. And as I've told you before, a float container only is 4 bytes in size whereas a double variable takes up 8 bytes. So this won't fit, and we have to explicitly tell the compiler to treat this value as a float by adding an f. Now if you're wondering why Eclipse underlines all this in yellow, it's just because we're not using these variables in any logical context. It's just a warning, so don't worry about it. So anyway, these are the options we have to store numerical data. What about textual data? We have two options for that. Car, which stands for character. Oops would help if we could type correctly. And string. Now with a character, we can store a single, well, character. Whether it's a small or capitalized letter, a symbol, or a digit doesn't matter. You have to keep in mind though when you store digits inside of a character or a string that they will be treated as textual data, not numerical data. Also of characters, you have to keep in mind to use single quotations when assigning them. And just for your information, it takes up two bytes of memory to allocate a character. Now let's get to the string. As you can see, we have the ability to store texts inside of strings. Earlier I've told you that string belongs to the complex data types. This is because string is actually a class. How do I know that? Well, if you look closely, when I created the string variable, I started it with a capital S. And as per convention, classes always start with a capital letter. And what we see here is, of course, text. But in reality, it's just a sequence of characters. This is one of the reasons why strings don't have a fixed container size. Because the size can vary depending on how many characters are inside. Well, this is just a tidbit of information for you there. We will cover this in more detail when we write our own classes. The thing to keep in mind when creating strings is that we have to use double quotations on those, contrary to the single quotations for characters. But I think this is all the time I have for this episode. I hope you found it useful. If you did, feel free to subscribe so you won't miss out on new videos. See you next time!